Up next, a preview of the latest Valeria game soon to launch on Kickstarter from Daily Magic Games. All right, first of all, you've got to be aware that this is a preview, not a review. The reason I clarify that is that over the last few weeks, I have been playing a prototype copy of Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria that Daily Magic Games was awesome enough to let me check out. Now, because it's a prototype, there is a chance, I would say 100% chance, that the final project will be different in some way from what I'm reviewing here. Because I'm told at this point the rulebook is 80% complete, the artwork is pretty much final. Now, David's my contact at Daily Magic Games has let me know that since sending out the prototypes, they have been doing a lot of playtesting and they've been getting feedback from people like me who have been um, playing the game to review it, have let them know some issues. So they have made some changes that have made the gameplay tighter and more enjoyable, but without changing the overall, like the big mechanics. Uh, for example, when we get to the game, this will make more sense, but they have changed it so that the award tiles make sure that there's different types of awards up every game. And then uh, there was one other change that I know happened for sure, and I'm forgetting off the top of my head. It was something I suggested, and like, oh, we did that already. And I'm like, oh, awesome. Um, and in solo play, there's now a thing where you recycle the champions that are in play. So they have made some changes. So just so you know, this is not the final game. This is the prototype. Now, Shadow Kings of Valeria is scheduled to go live on Kickstarter right now. It's scheduled for July the 7th. That looks like it's going to be a good date. I have gotten to see a preview of the Kickstarter page, and I got to say it looks good. I think people are going to be excited about this. The price point looks right. Um, they're doing an interesting thing with no, no stretch goals, and they do have some interesting Kickstarter exclusives that are going to be there as well. Well, since all we have is a prototype of Shadow Kingdoms, we did not record an no. unboxing video so as not to confuse people with components that may not represent those from the final product. Now, I do have to say, for a prototype, this looked good. Like, it looked really good. It almost looked like a complete game. Like, I've had a few prototypes that I've done reviews on in the past. Um, most recently, I think Builders of Blankenberg expansion fields and flocks. And, like, that didn't even have all the art. I had a lot of cards with just words on them and stuff like that for that game. And I had like meeple painted different colors and that. So like, like we got these awesome monster meeples that came with it that I'm like, I want to keep these. They're awesome. And they have nothing to do with what's going to be in the final thing, but they're really cool. Little monster meeples. I, I think they're from, um, oh, I forget the name of the company. Meeple source, I think is who makes these monster meeples. So it was a nice touch to throw those in there and everything has art on it. Um, so the meeples are definitely changing. Now, as far as I know, the art is going to be the same. And the art is, of course, by the Miko. Uh, the Miko knocked it out of the park, I gotta say, with this game. Like, I'm always a fan of the Miko stuff, and this looks really good. Now, this is not just the art of the cards, but the layout of the board, the iconography, where everything is, just looks great with lots of slavering hordes and baddies all over the artwork. Not that you're a fanboy or anything, but it's really hard to fault you for that, given the quality turns out on all of his game projects. All right. Now, the reason there's monsters everywhere in this art is because this particular Valeria game, instead of playing the heroes, you are playing the monsters who are raiding the kingdoms of Valeria. A sharp about face from previous Valeria games. Yes. So to start off the game, a uh, player is going to pick one of the five monstrous hordes, the five armies to play. Uh, they're going to take a player board for that race. They're going to pick one of five two-sided campaign map boards. Um, they're going to pick one of the two sides. Uh, the player boards are going to have a place to track influence, gold, and magic, the three resources of the game. There are also spots to put dice and gems. And then there's indicators that show where you're going to place cards you collect during the game. Players are going to take 10 victory markers uh, in the prototype. These are just like basically tiddlywinks. And they're going to use these to cover up parts of the player board. Now, these are things that you're going to be able to unlock as the game goes on, but start the game blocked off. So different races on player boards, covering up things on your board to be revealed as you play. Is this game like Terra Mystica? <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's more like kinds of Caldonia. <laughs> so anyway. The center board consists of a scoring track surrounding five different areas they call shrines. Um, there are also spots to put three rows of champion cards and a row of battle plans and a set of three award cards. Now, decks of each of these are shuffled and the appropriate number of cards are laid out at the start of the game. You draw a number of dice from the bag that are rolled and placed on each shrine. This is based on the number of players. For example, in a three-player game, you are going to put out five at the beginning of the game. 
Now, the dice come in five colors, and these match each of the five armies. They're numbered one to six, which represents the strength on the die, but they also have a bit of additional information. So there's the strength, which is the biggest value, makes it look like a normal die, but then there's also an army type. Now, the army type's determined by the die color, but they also throw a symbol on there, and that's for um, color blindness reasons. So if you can't tell the colors apart, you can read the dice by the symbol. And then there's a little gold symbol, which is a discount value. Now, this is equal to the opposite side of the die minus one. So like if you have a four, the other side of a four is a two, which gives you a discount of one. Or if you have a five, uh, you get a discount. Sorry, if four has a discount of two, because when you flip a four over, it's a three, and a three minus one is two. And uh, a one gives you a five discount, because when you flip a one over, it's a six, and you subtract one, and you get five. And a six is no discount. But like to make it easier to do that math, it's right there in the just a little symbol to do this discount amount. That is almost asking too much information from a simple little six-sided die. Yeah, these are standard side dice. I didn't have the problem with it. Plus, like I said, you can do the math if you know what it is. Uh, you might, and plus it's like you, all you got to know is one through five. And after playing once, you're going to remember what those discards well, are. I'm just thinking and the again, number the of other... mechanics wedged onto one little d6. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it is three different things on each yep. die, which is kind of impressive. Now, each turn, you're going to take your warden, which is a little meeple for your army, and you're going to place it either on one of the five shrines that has a die on it, or you're going to place it on your board in your camp, and you only do that to perform a battle. What's important is that every turn you do have to move. You can't stay in the same place, which is why this does have a worker placement element. Uh, otherwise, you just pick a spot and take a die. Uh, when you place on a die, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to draft one of the dice from that shrine, and you're going to place it on your player board. You start the game limited to three, but you can unlock up to five slots for dice. Then after taking the die, you then do the action for that shrine. When we're talking about wardens, this is essentially the, the leader of your clan or, you know, race or yeah, your, whatever. Yeah, your the... war band, your army. It's like the, the, the it's, it's your, your lieutenant or whatever that you're moving out to, to collect resources. Right. So there are five shrines. And really to understand the game, I'm going to have to go through each of the shrines pretty quickly. So first, it's a gem shrine. You're going to take a die and take a gem. Now, you can only hold one gem at the start of the game, and again, you can unlock more slots up to three. And what these do is these are a way to mitigate the die rolls. One gem can flip a die over to its opposite side, or it can make a die wild, counting it as belonging to any of the armies. So with all this talk of unlocking both on, the on these two shrines, this really seems like a progression-driven game. Yeah. Uh, do things, get more things, so that you can do more things to get more things. Yeah, pretty much that way. Um, some of the stuff you're just unlocking to to give you more room, like more freedom, like you know, remove a cap, and other things do literally give you new actions. So it's a, it's a combination of both. So some give you more space and some give you new abilities. So the magic shrine is next. This one is take a die and either get two magic or claim an award. Now magic is another thing that's used to mitigate dice. It can be used for a couple things. First, you can roll up any of your dice by ones for spending one magic per point. So turn a three into a four for one magic. Second, it can be used to cycle through the cards on the board. So when you're going to buy a champion or a battle plan, you can spend a magic to remove one of the cards from the play area, put it to the bottom of the deck, and draw a new one. Now, the awards are randomized at the beginning of the game, and they're going to reward players to achieve whatever's shown on the card. And the first player to get an award gets a bunch of points. The second player gets less points. And anyone else that completes it after the second player gets some points, but it's the worst amount. Now, these include all kinds of different things, like having a certain player pattern on your campaign board, having a certain set of battle plans of different types, or collecting a set number of champions, or having so many things reserved, or having so many dice, all kinds of different variety here. So this is uh, sort of split between a victory bonus area for end game and uh, part of that the sort of um, engine mechanic, where you've got that magic to, to help... Uh, kick things along when you're doing other things yeah in a way it's, it's it's a race right so this is a get this thing before anyone else gets this thing right now the champion shrine this you take a die and then buy a champion so these represent like heroes in your army you get to apply that discount value of the die to the cost of the champions and the champion come in three types there's instance so you buy the champion and it does something and it's done usually gives you some resources they're dirt cheap there's Ongoing champions that give you some kind of special ability that keeps going, they cost a little bit more. 
And then there's end game champions that don't give you anything during play, but will give you end game scoring opportunities. And those are the most expensive. Now there are a ton of champions that come with the game and they all do all kinds of things. Like there's no way I can cover all of it. Basically you can get in game resources. You can get extra strength or you can get victory points from completing certain types of battles. You can get discounts on future actions. Uh, they can give you rewards when you take actions. Like uh, there's a huge mix. And then calling back to one of, Daily Magic's other games, it also has a mechanic that I remember from Valeria Card Kingdoms, where you have to pay more for collecting champions of the same type you already have, where if you pay one for every one you already have of that type. Now, again, there's an unlocking mechanic here. At the start of the game, you can only have three champions, but you can unlock slots for up to ten. Oh, well, at least they're keeping the uh, the unlocking theme rolling. Jeez. Next is the gold shrine. This is one of the simplest ones. You take a die, then you get gold equal to the absolute value of the discount value. So normally a two would give you a four discount. Well, instead you get four gold. And a five would give you one gold. Now gold is needed to pay for those champions and battle plans, which we'll get to in a second. Gotta get that bling somehow. So next, the uh, most complicated shrine is the tactic shrine. You take a die and you reserve one of the in-play battle plans. You apply the discount value on the die to the cost, because now there's a row of five battle plans on the board that cost from one to five gold each. When you reserve a battle plan, it goes into this reserve spot under your player board. Now, only one of those is unlocked at the beginning of the game, but up to three can be unlocked, and each of those gives you a bonus if you reserve a card here. For example, the first one lets you spend one gold to increase your influence, which we'll find out is very important in just a minute. So more unlocking, this time marching orders for your horde. All right, next is the camp. So this is not a shrine. This is you place on your player board, and you only do this when you have a battle plan and you are ready to perform a battle. First, you're going to select which battle plan to complete. Now, this can be one you reserve from the tactic shrine, or it can be any of the ones that are face up on the board. You just have to pay the gold to get them. Now, each battle plan lists one of three types. It's either a bow and arrow, an axe, or a catapult, and they list two to four dice types on them. Now, these could be all the same die, all the same color, or it could be a mix and match of any of the five die types. To complete it, you're going to turn in a set of matching dice that match the symbols on the plan or the color. Now, remember, you can use gems to swap the color of a die, and you have an upgrade that lets you use one die type as wild. And this is dependent on the race. Like The red race can use red dice as wild, and the undead gray race can use gray dice as wild, and so on. The gargoyles can use black dice as wild. Um... Once your dice are to picked, so once you've got your dice match up to your thing, you will add up the strength. So this is your main number on the die. You're going to add any additional strengths from champions and upgrades on your board. And then again, you can use your magic to roll up dice. This will give you a total for how much strength you're bringing to this battle. Which makes you think you just want the biggest numbers you can. But the problem is, your army is only as good as your influence. Influence is a cap. You can't have a battle total higher than your influence. So what happens is, say I got 36 on my, well, 36 would be crazy, 18 on my dice, I got three sixes, but my influence is only 12, well, my battle total can be 12 only. It can't be any better. So what you're going to do now is once you have your adjusted battle total based on influence, you're going to look up on a chart and see how many victory points you get. If you have less than seven points, you only score one point. Hitting at least eight gets you three points, hitting at least 11 gets you six, hitting at least 14 gets you nine, and so on. It keeps scaling up. Now, use dice or return to the bag. And the battle plan is pushed to the side of your playing board. Now, you've completed a battle. That means your army has learned something. You've raided Valeria, so you get to level up your army. And this gets to all that unlocking we talked about. What's going to happen is you're going to remove one of the 10 victory tokens from your player board and place it on the campaign board. Doing this does two things. First off, removing a victory token unlocks new things. This will let you do things like remove your resource cap of 14, hold more dice, collect more champions, unlock more battle plan reserve spots, unlock your racial ability, hold more gems, or give you a permanent plus one strength. Then the token removed is placed on the campaign board, and what spot you cover up will give you bonus points based on what battle plan you completed. For example, there's a spot on each board that gives plus two points for each of the battle types. So if you completed a bow and arrow, battle type you can put your chip over the blow and arrow on the campaign board and get two extra points there are others that give points based on what dice were used and so on now in addition to that the campaign board is actually a nine by nine grid 
Or sorry, three by three grid. I said nine by nine. It's a nine spot grid, a three by three grid with nine spots. And if you put two tokens next to each other, you unlock a chain bonus. And this is shown on the board between them. Now, these include influence, the thing you need to be able to get your army out there, gold and magic, so all the free resources, drafting a die free off the board, or getting free champions off the main board. So not a simple just do X, get Y upgrade mechanic with the you know combo breakers and things going on. No, this is definitely like a lot of options and choice at this point. Like once you complete that first battle plan, what you choose to unlock is going to change which way your army develops going forward in the game. Now the game keeps keep doing this, rinse, repeat until someone has completed several battle plan seven battle plans, and then do some uh, finish off the round. So like everyone doesn't get one turn. If it's the first player's turn, everyone's going to go that one turn. If it's the last player's turn, they're going to go when the game ends. Uh, you just finish off the round. Then players get any end game points from the champions. Uh, you also get one point per die you still have left, and the player with the most points wins. All right, well, not a simple game. The scoring, scoring seems pretty straightforward, if not the path to get those points. Yeah. Now, in addition to the rules I just explained, which are the multiplayer game rules, the game also includes a solo mode. Uh, this has you playing against a ghost adversary player. Uh, it's pretty simple. What you do is you place the uh, another player, another color's warden on the gem shrine. And every time you take an action, the warden, uh, the adversary moves one spot clockwise. If it manages to get all the way around to the tactics shrine, they then automatically complete the most expensive battle plan. And now there's a little bit more to it about not being able to the same spots and them getting bonus points. But you know what? I don't think it's worth getting into those details here. But I will say the solo game plays very similar to the multiplayer game. You know, a nice feature, even if it's not one that a majority of players might use, there are a growing number of solo players out there, especially in times like these. Yes. Hell, I, I actually played it solo, <laughs> which I don't do very often. Now, as for playing the game, uh, actual thoughts on the game, I am digging it a lot. Uh, but I do need to note it is very different from the other games in the Valeria series I've played. All the other games I've played have been card-driven and generally involve using those cards to get resources to buy more cards and build a tableau. While Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria does have cards, I wouldn't call this card-driven. This is definitely much more of a worker placement dice drafting set collection game where the cards are there, but they represent bonuses and goals that you're trying to achieve. Now, I'm not saying this is bad. I just think it's important that fans, especially Valeria fans, should know that this is a twist on what you get from the other games in the series. Now, and this is actually, I think, kind of a big deal. The fact that this game diverges so greatly from the others can't really be stressed enough, not because it's bad, but because you don't want fans, and there are a number of fans of the Valeria system, having mm -hmm. buyer's remorse if they were expecting more of the same. And to be honest, it's the same problem I saw with Horizons, which is a different game from Daily Magic Games, where everyone thought it was going to be Valeria in space, and it very much wasn't. It was very much a standalone game, but I think the expectation for that game was, oh, it's Daily Magic, it's going to be roll the dice to generate resources to play characters, or it's going to be draft characters from the center thing and build a tableau comprising of characters and buildings, because that's kind of what all the other games are. Right. Now, Shadow Kingdoms itself, I would not say is hard to learn. Um, I was able to teach my daughter uh, easily enough. It's not particularly heavy, but there are a lot of decision points in the game, and you are going to have a lot of options presented in front of you at once. What's interesting is that it still plays deceptively quickly. With most games we've had with experienced players taking about an hour, depending on AP and how many people you're playing with, with solo games taking like 20 minutes. Well, and that seems about on par with the other Valeria games. I mean, I, I, an hour an hour or so with three people who understand the game and have you know played before, slap it down, get to it. Yeah, sounds about right. Like the, I've, I've had some card kingdoms go a little longer, but usually only until you get up to five players. Right. Anything shorter of that does seem pretty quick. Now, things I do like are the, the dice, the fact that you have multi-use dice that do different things. Like I really like the way they use the, the discount versus the strength and how those two play out. Because in general, you want high dice numbers so that when you're completing battle plans, you get a ton of points, right? But if you do that, you're not getting any discounts. And if you don't get any discounts, you're going to run out of resources, especially gold, really quickly. 
So when you're buying for champions, like I'm going to go buy it, I'm going to go to the champion shrine. I kind of want to go six because I want to complete a battle plan with a six. But you know what? If I take a one or two, I'm going to save four or five gold on buying that champion, which could be well worth it. And then there's the fact that you can use your magic and gems to turn that one or two you drafted into higher numbers once it actually does get to battles. And I think that's really neat. The whole, you want high or do you want low and the balance of the dice basically based on their opposite sides because their standard D6 is that seven. Right. I also really like the influence system. I did Thematically, it makes sense to me. Like your army's only as good as your influence. It's only as good as your general. I thought that was cool. And I like having that cap. Like it just seems neat. Because, yeah, I could go out there and collect all the sixes in the board, but it doesn't matter if my influence is sitting at starting view of 10. Right. So you've got a lot of aspects to manage, machines to build to make use of those lower dice and ratchet up their values with gems and magic. <laughs> it's, it, there's, it's not a simple you know, or simplistic no. game. I, I, yeah, I would say that. Now, there is one thing I was disappointed with. Um, probably no surprise to fans of the show. Uh, and that's a, a lack of asymmetry at the beginning of the game. Because when you read the rules and the background and you have these armies and these five different armies and recruiting different types of troops for your army, it just sounds like you're going to have a, a bigger difference between the different races. And then the campaign boards, when I first played, the first time I played it, I'm like, wow, look, at there's five different two-sided campaign boards. That's a lot of different choices. And we're each going to get a different one. But then when you sit down and look at both those things, for one, the army, the only thing that it does by playing Knowles, which are the red army, is that I can unlock an ability that means red dice are wild. If I play the undead, which are white, well, I can unlock an ability that makes the white dice wild. And if I play the gargoyles, I can unlock an ability that makes the black dice wild. That's it. That's all you get for, for asymmetry, which really isn't to me. Like, to me, it's all the same. They just consider a different die wild. And then the campaign boards... Seem like they're really different until you look at them, and then you realize there are the exact same symbols on every single one, every side, but just in different order. Right. So, none of the Valeria games strike me as highly asymmetric, but I think the number of choices and the way that a player can choose their path and go off in very different directions... Uh, is what allows the divergence in these games, right? So they, they, I think they, I, they almost seem to like that lack of asymmetry at the beginning, because the game itself has such a variety of options. I fair enough, and and to be honest, that is definitely a design goal for them: is that the game becomes more asymmetric as it goes on. Right. The the more you play, like what you choose to do, which champions you hire and what you unlock is probably going to be different than what champions I hire and what I unlock. And that is going to make our armies completely different by the end of the game. So that is definitely fair. It just everyone knows how much I like asymmetry. I want it at the beginning. I, I want to craft a clan and get some unique ability. Right. Like even just looking at the game, having played it a, a solid number of times when I'm playing the Knowles. I want it that whenever I use a Knoll die, for every brown die, I get plus one because Knolls are dogs and they have pack tactics. And when I'm playing Undead, after I've completed a battle, I should be able to take my lowest level die and put it back on my board because I've re-resurrected my troops. Like, just to me, that would it fits the mechanics and it fits the theme better. Right. But I agree. The game does diverge from the original. It's a totally point. Just like more. Maybe, maybe what I'm thinking, what, I, what they might need to do is add that in as an expansion later, like toss that in. Like maybe they're avoiding that for the, the initial game and they have plans. Cause I gotta say daily magic is fam famous for small box, small expansions that actually add quite a bit to the games that are relatively cheap. And maybe we'll see something like that coming. Well, it's interesting. And ancient games in the chat room pointed out something, uh, you know, card kingdoms isn't asymmetrical. So why would she expect yes, it is. you get a Duke at the beginning of the game that is totally unique from everyone else. Yeah, well, I have issues with the Dukes, but they, that doesn't change the game. That's like just the scoring. Dukes, that's, but, that, but that doesn't. Symmetric. But well, that's just your, your end game scoring, though. That doesn't affect the game. Yeah, as it you, does because what you go for is going to be completely dependent on what you're going to score at the end of the game. That's what you don't like about the game. Well, I don't. The I don't like it is because <laughs> what I don't like is the fact that it, that the grammar is wrong and I can't. Uh, I, I always go for the wrong thing because I it doesn't read right for, to me, but. <laughs> It's an game goal, and it gives yep. you something to aim yep. for. It gives you direction. But Plus, with the latest, it was Shadow Veil, you also get an artifact. 
So you get two things that make your race asymmetric. So no, that is in their games. Okay. Now I got to make Quest of Valeria and Villages of Valeria don't think have anything asymmetric. But I mean, my my thought so is fair. a lot of the times when we see these uh, player boards, right, specific player yeah. boards, that really drives our belief in asymmetry, yes. right? Why are you going to have all these fancy different player boards for all these different races if, if it's really not asymmetric? Uh, and yeah. so I, I think there's an expectation with player boards like that sure. that that drives that that want of asymmetry. I'll put it this I, I don't think they're the same designer. Actually, I'm positive they're not because Levi Moat's the designer of the other yeah. one. And I don't remember if I mentioned the name of the designer in this one. It's in the written review. I probably should have thrown that in the show notes once I looked it up. Um, look at Horizons, where you have the human sides of the boards, where mm -hmm. everyone's the same, and then you can flip it to the alien side of the board with unique abilities. Right. I would love to see something like that for this. Like, I have the... It doesn't have to be humans, but it could be, like, here's the orcs, and then there's the advanced orcs or whatever. Right. And I don't know what the orcs get instead of the other races, but I think it'd be cool. Anyway, this, again, this is minor, right? So this is not a huge complaint it's just something when i see player board like sean's i see it and i read it and we're all going to play different armies i want my armies to feel different i want my orcs to feel different than my skeletons to feel different from uh my my uh, was it gargoyles i'm trying to remember the there's orcs uh undead gnolls gargoyles and i cannot remember what the last oh uh green things goblins probably right. in this game sorry stan kordanov's Kordonsky? Stan Kordonsky is the the designer of this game. So this uh, is another thing that I think is worth noting that's important. Uh, is there is not a lot of player interaction in Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria. Like, except for the fact that I might take a die you want, and I might do that intentionally. It could be hate drafting, but more likely it's just I took something I wanted and it ends up you wanted it too. And the race to get those three awards before anyone else, there isn't really any way to influence the other players' play at all. Like none of the champions affect anything except your own stuff. Like there's no steal gold or take a die. None of that is in this. And I think this is going to be a huge plus for some players and possibly a minus for others who like the direct conflict. Yeah, no, and this is, this is um, you know, we've talked about it, you know, group solitaire. It's a divisive topic uh, in gaming right now. Uh, we talk about it a lot in our Euro Games versus American Style episode. We did. Now, what I would love to see is what they did. I, I guess I bring up Horizons a lot. Same publisher. What do you expect? In Horizons, it's a 3X game. It's missing the fourth X, Extermination. You can buy a separate expansion called Extermination that adds player versus player conflict. I would love to see that come out for this. I would I would love to see a Shadow Kings of Very expansion that all it has to do is add some champions in that let me steal champions from other players, put something on a die, block a shrine so no one can go there. I don't I don't know exactly what the design would be, but it seems like it would easily integrate with the game. And I gotta say, slavering hordes, war bands fighting against each other to become prominent really fits well in theme to me. Absolutely. All right. Overall, I found a lot to like in this game. Um, now it doesn't really play like the other Valeria games to me, but you know what? I think it's a great addition to the line of games. It's a very cool worker placement dice drafting game with plenty of ways to mitigate the randomness of the dice. So if you're worried about the dice with the, the fact that, even though these are useful because of the discount and the fact you have the gems and the magic to be able to spin them up and flip them over. I, I never felt that I was stuck in the game because the bad dice only were up. The mechanics are pretty simple to learn. And I gotta say it plays surprisingly quick for the amount of time decision there is. Like there are a lot of options. You got five shrines to pick from every turn. Well, t technically four, cause you'd be on one of them, but you have five different options every turn and different ways to go. I, I'm surprised by how quick it can be. Now, I got to admit, I, I would have preferred the armies were a bit more asymmetric. Um, but you know what? I've never had a bad time playing this game at all player counts. I guess I, when this goes live, again, July 7th, um, if you're listening to this way after that, hopefully it's in your, your local stores, I recommend checking this game out. Now, this goes for people who are fans of Valeria games in general. If you just want a game with beautiful Miko art, you got one right here. That board, oh, it's so beautiful. Um, but I think people who dig worker placement games and people who like dice-based games that are doing something different, 
Like, this isn't your standard. This isn't even like Alien Frontiers. It's doing something different with D6s. I wouldn't say they're standard dice because they do have extra symbols on them. But just with D6-based dice, I think there is a lot to like here for a wide range of hobby gamers. All right, well, for a more in-depth look at this prototype version of Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria, you can read head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Reviews.